Our gospel comes from the gospel according to Mark. This is chapter 7, multiple verses, 1 through 8, 14 and 15, and 21 through 23. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And that they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. But there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So for the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrine. You abandon the commandment of God and hold on to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your glorious sight. For you and you alone are God. You are our rock and our salvation. Amen. Our text this morning point us to the difference between actions that have no roots in faith and the actions that come from transformed hearts, minds, and lives. The point in both James and Mark is that it is from it is what is within us that from and that much you look that was a rewind. It is is that it is from what is within us that we reveal who we are. It isn't that we shouldn't wash our hands. It isn't that traditions are unfavorable. We certainly have traditions. The Jews have traditions. The Roman Catholics have traditions. We have a framework in which we confess our sins every Sunday. That's part of our tradition, partly because it is crucial and valuable for us to acknowledge that we are not fit to stand before the throne of God. So there are meaningful traditions, and we are to throw those away, but we are to make the tradition the vitally important thing. Some people talk about the Lord's Prayer being something we do by rote without really thinking about what it means when we pray to our Father. We know it. We've said it since we were children. And that can be a meaningless tradition unless we truly understand that we are praying specifically the prayer that Jesus taught and that we know what we are asking, that we're actually asking God for God's kingdom to come, for God's will to be done. And we acknowledge that just as the Israelites in the desert received manna one time a day, we are asking for what we need one day at a time. Tradition has value, and it helps us to find our place in worship. It helps us come to a different building, into a different mindset, and have a different experience. Jesus is not casting out tradition. But he wants to put tradition under the value of God's commandments, the value of God's word, and of worshiping God. Jesus talks about Isaiah's prophecies as well as Jeremiah. When you read the major prophets, you will find that all of the prophets are saying to Israel, all of them say, sure, you've got the ceremony and the tradition down, and you're performing it great, but it's meaningless and therefore it's disgusting to God because it doesn't have any heart connection. It is our lives that are to be transformed. 
So tradi the tradition or the traditions that we observe are only as valuable as they can be if we take them in. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we eat the body of Christ. We are sustained by who Christ is and what Christ has done in much the same way that the food we put into our bodies promotes growth within us. The food we eat provides the nutrition that we must have to grow and develop as healthy human beings. Jesus wants us to take God's word, God's law, into our hearts because that is what we live out. What defiles us is our thoughts. We have a mouth, and whether we want it to or not, our mouth will speak what is in our hearts. So it is our heart that we need to be tending. It is our heart that needs transformation. Larry Crabb wrote a book called Inside Out. It's a good book. In it, he addresses that the change in us must come from the inside in order to be manifested authentically on the outside. The Christian church is so often accused of hypocrisy because we come to church and we read the scriptures and we sing the hymns and then we go home and we're ugly to our neighbors or we're rude on the road or we aren't loving to our spouse. There are many ways that we forget what we do here when we're supposed to take home here in here. That's H-E-A-R and H-E-R-E. And what the Spirit brings us, we're to live that out in the world. And that is what James is talking about. Most of you know I'm a big fan of Martin Luther. Please don't report me to the Presbytery. And I think that he tore the letter of James out of his Bible. He despised it, and he did not think it should be included in the canon. I think that's because so many of us are prone to do works out of our own obligation or our own sense of rightness, rather like the Pharisees who stood on the steps of the synagogue and said, thank you, God, that I'm not like that wretched person. We want to remember that what we put in here, I indicate heart and head, it says a reminder to me, what we put in here is what's to come out in our lives. And if it is to be authentic, we have to have the inner transformation. We actually have to let God change who we are. God will, can, and wants to renew us, transform us, transfigure us, so that we become more and more like Christ. But that's not something that he imposes upon any of us. It is our invitation. It's our surrender to the Lord that says, here I am, do whatever needs to be done to bring me to a place where I'm closer to living out your image in the world. Now Luther, of course, was not opposed to good works. Luther believed that if we spend time in prayer with God, and if we spend time reading God's word and letting God's word seep into us, then we will be propelled to do what to, to do what we want to do. And so that's to let the love of Christ be manifest in the world by our actions, by our loving of others, and by our doing good works. But we, I think, as people have a tendency to say, okay, I have to be nice to that person because that's what is expected of me. But that is not where it starts. It starts with the inner transformation. You must have the love of God inside your being for the authentic love of God to be expressed externally to others. This requires discipline. This requires us to confess that we are often greedy. This may be just me. I mean, if this doesn't invite any of you, please speak to me after the service. But we are often greedy, resentful, or mean-spirited toward people. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but I would bet that everyone in this room has at least one person that they actually don't like at all. To pretend that you care for them has no life in it. We know when we are cared for. We know when we are loved. It's, it's tangible to us because we sense it. It's a spiritual thing. So if you're bringing up fake affection to someone, believe me, they buy it. You might as well not waste your time. So we are to come to love of people really love them in truth. Years ago, I met a woman who talked about her ex-husband. 
She resented the heck out of him and couldn't find a good thought about him. She went to her spiritual director who told her to pray for him faithfully, pray for him faithfully every day. So she did, initially with resentment, as in, well, Lord, bless so-and-so, bless that so-and-so. But it turned out that every day she prayed a little more sincerely. I, she did not tell us, and I cannot tell you, the length of time that it took, but she was transformed by praying for this man toward whom she had felt great resentment and great pain and anger. Her prayers changed her heart so that she came to feel lovingly toward her ex-husband who had done her wrong. This is what our prayer life is intended to do. We really are to pray for the people that are most difficult for. I'm gonna just, oh, this is a rabbit trail. I'm sorry, Dan scolded me for too many rabbit trails last time. But here's a rabbit trail. On the retreat that I was on last week, um, there was a woman that when I initially we encountered one another, I thought she looked at me kind of funny. So I definitely looked at her kind of funny bag. And I started to decide, I thought, well, you know, there's something about her I just don't like. Well, this was a time of serious prayer. And in my prayer life, I thought, Levon, what is it, what is it triggering in you? Where's the issue in you that you're perceiving a difficulty with this woman? That's what our prayer life is intended to do, to make us look more deeply into who we are, to go, it's not her fault. What's going on in me that I took such a reaction to her? And it turned out that we got along just fine by the time we were able to speak on the final Friday. So God can work miracles even in your pastor. Let's all say amen to that. Uh, so we are to spend real time, real time with Jesus Christ, who is available to us always in our hearts. We must spend time with him every day. You've seen that little blurb, it's a meme that goes around on Facebook that says, Lord, I want to thank you so much for the day and for my sense of peace and um, my faith in you. But in a minute, I'm going to get out of bed and things are likely to get tricky after that. And that's a paraphrase. But you know, it's often a very good thing when you open your peepers, start your prayer life then. And it doesn't have to be so humorous. But remember the people for whom we have promised to pray as a congregation or your friends that you know are going through issues. Start your prayer life looking out toward others. We are, we are children of God. We are able to be transformed through Christ who came to save us in all senses of the word. We are both sinners and saints. We come to church knowing that we are supposed to be good Christian people. So the secret things about ourselves, the things that we've left in the closet at home, those things we have to hide. And consequently, we are not authentically present with, the, with one another in our brokenness. Now there may be a couple of people who have shown you their rawness or their ugliness, their dark underbelly, but most of us come to church spit and polished so that we look like the Christians we think we are supposed to look like. And part of what that does is make us hide the very aspects of ourselves that Jesus wants to, is ready to, and needs to heal within us. Think about how we treat people who are not yet part of the body of faith, people who have not yet encountered the living Christ. So many of those conversations are about telling that person that they need to stop living the way they're living or stop doing what they're doing like what they're doing is wrong. Well, how winning is that? Think of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and explained that he had kept all the commandments and he'd done all of the right things. So he wanted to know what else he needed to do to gain heaven. And you know, you remember that Jesus told him to give up all that he had and to follow him. Essentially, what Jesus was telling him was to stop being who you have always been, stop identifying yourself as who you have been, and be renewed. The rich young ruler wasn't yet prepared to do it. Jesus was not mad at him. The scriptures tell us that when the young man went away, Jesus loved him. Jesus had compassion for him. That is our job. That is our duty not to evaluate the worthiness of anyone else or the level of their sinfulness. Um, anybody, Speck and uh, Redwood. Uh, I mean, these are the things that 
transform our faith life as we journey daily. Our goal as men and women who are truly following Jesus Christ is to become changed men and women. That change is to manifest love in our hearts, love that we can express to people who may not be living the lives we think Christ would have them live, those who may be engaged in lifestyles counter to biblical teaching. We need to applaud those things, but we can still, as God does, love those people. What are the two commandments on which everything hangs? Love the Lord your God with all you've got, and love your pesky neighbors like you want to be loved yourself. That's our job. In our time, in our country, which is so divided, we have been given a gift that we can bring to others. The renewal that we read in the Song of Solomon, that spring has come, that a new life is available. And ladies and gentlemen, we are to have that new life growing in us. We need to daily come metaphorically naked before God and say, here I am, a sedan, heal me. Show me who you are calling me to become, who I was designed and created to be. This is the point in Mark's gospel where Jesus is moving from being only with and for the Jews. He is now going to move into the Gentile community. This is the widening of the kingdom of God. The welcoming and the opening of the wide doors to God's love. That is what we should be sharing with others. But unless you are being transformed, your love will sound like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It is not going to be music, and we are to bring music into the world. The turtle dove is singing in our land. The fig trees are blossoming. We are those fig trees and those turtle doves. This is what all of the texts are pointing to this morning, James and Jesus. So don't put tradition first. Don't put works first. Put the transforming power and love of Christ in you first. And as you are transformed, what you send out will be God's love for all of glory. Because trust me, if he can love me, and I know he does, he can love everyone else. And that is the message that we are to carry to a broken world and to people who are lost and in pain. Pray with me, please. Righteous God, you lead us by example through your generous love and remind us that there is always more to learn about what it means to live a life of righteousness. Help us to keep our faith nimble, growing with each new neighbor we meet and each experience we live. May we be doers of a word that is deep and wide, letting our lives reflect the love we have received. We ask it in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. If you are able, please stand once again as we will sing our next hymn, Change My Heart, O God, number 654.